So what I'd like to do today, this is our last lecture on phase diagram, so that's exciting. But let me let me sort of put it all into perspective with a little drawing here. So where's my pen? Okay. So I'm just gonna draw a really tall TX phase diagram. Okay. So this is temperature on the y-axis and composition of substance A on the x-axis, 1 and 0. And so we did, we started out with the px phase diagram. Okay, and we'll, we'll draw that over here. And we did the vapor pressures. So we had this. So this was the P star for A. That was the pure vapor pressure of A. And then we had this one up here, which was P star of B. And what are those two lines that I've drawn? So this is like a little bit of review. So on the PX phase diagram, you go with the, the pressure, the vapor pressure of each of these substances. So this is this is A. So at pure A, that's the vapor pressure of pure A. So what is the this linear trend where it's the vapor pressure of A is equal to the mole fraction of A times P star of A? What's that called? <laughs> you have three three ch three choices. There's three laws associated with the vapor pressure. Routes law. Good. Okay. So this is Routes Law. So that's these lines right here. Okay, and then the total vapor pressure is the sum of all of those. So P total is equal to PA plus PB. Which law is that? No, you have two choices, Henry's or Dalton's. Yeah, I just told you no, so you know which one it is. That's Dalton's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's Dalton's. Okay, you've answered twice, so it's, we have to get somebody else involved now. Good job. And then where is Henry's law on this chart? <clears throat> It could go below or above. So, yeah, so the curvy one is the Margulies equation, and there's lots of different equations. So I'll draw a curvy one here. I'll draw a curvy one like this. Oh, gosh, that's a bad curve. Let me come from the top. So it's so it comes down here and hits 0 like that. It has a different slope at 0 for B. I should do this one in a different color. See if I can find my colors. Yes, uh oh. I, 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 I. All right, so. Look at how advanced I am. Okay, this is good. So that's the curvy one, and I'm going to draw the little dashed lines that I have. What is this dashed line? It's a linear trend that comes off of this as it goes to zero. This one. So these dashed lines, these linear trends, go up to the Henry's Law constant. So they're Henry's Law. And it's PA is equal to K, uh, is equal to X. I'm sorry, is equal to XA times KA, or the Henry's Law constant. So that's this one right there. And the other one for B, right? So the Henry's Law constants are the dashed lines in blue.
I don't get the pop up on my screen on my laptop. I have to turn around and see it. Okay. So this is the, the these are all of the vapor liquid equilibrium regions. So, you know, if you had one atmosphere right here, then that would be the boiling point. You know, I mean, it'd be the vapor pressure where, where these lines hit. Actually, let's, let's make it up here. So if that's one atmosphere, then right here is the normal boiling point for this mixture of a 50-50 combination, okay? Um, if you had, uh, let's say, I don't know, a lower temperature, you know, it might boil right here. So let's compare now this PX phase diagram to the TX phase diagram. So here's our, our boiling points. And so if we pick a, a one atmosphere uh, uh, pressure, then these are going to be our, our boiling points. So we're going to have this curve that's kind of related to the Dalton's Law curve. It's this total pressure. So when the total pressure of the mixture equals one atmosphere, then you have a boiling solution. And these are the temperatures associated with this. So this Dalton's Law curve Convert it over to temperature is right there. And so this would be the TB for A, so the boiling point for A. Mm, let me, I'm sorry, let me redraw this because I, I, I want to make sure that, oh, okay. okay, I got to redraw my box. The the lower vapor pressure needs to have a higher boiling point. So that's what I did wrong. Okay, so A over here has a lower vapor pressure, so it's gonna have the higher boiling point. And B has a higher vapor pressure, so it's gonna have a lower boiling point. So the T X phase diagram will look like this. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, and then this is the boiling point for, for substance B. Okay, so we're starting to draw now the TX phase diagrams. That's what we're finishing up today. So we're, we, the first ones we did were the vapor phase diagrams for mixtures. Now, where's the vapor phase in all of this? So if I look at this, this phase diagram um, and I put, let's say I put a dot right here. So I'm in, I'm in a fixed container. I'm at that temperature. I'm at a, a mixture of it looks like 60 or 70 percent A, and I'm right there at that temperature. Is it all liquid, all solid? I mean, are all all liquid, all gas, or a combination of liquid and gas? If I'm right here, it's all gas because I'm at a really high temperature, so I'm above the boiling points of all mixtures. So these are the boiling points of the mixtures on these lines. And so this is the this is the YA line, line YA, remember that, and this is the XA line. So this is vapor, and this is liquid. Let's, let's say this is uh, like nicotine in water, okay? Nicotine in water has a really weird partial miscibility, which we're going to cover today. But we get down in the liquid, there's a region of which the liquid separates into two phases for, for nicotine in water. And, and then there's a place where it recombines and is miscible again. <laughs> so it has, in its liquid phase, a T... UC and a TLC. So an upper consulate temperature and a lower consulate temperature. And in this region, there's two liquid phases. And it doesn't have to be a nice perfect circle. It could be some kind of lopsided thing. Okay, so that's what we have. And then today we're gonna to cool it down even further and we're gonna to get to the melting points. And so here's the melting point, TM for B. And this might be the melting point for A, T 
TM A. And the melting points do a funny thing. They come down like this, and there might be a eutectic mixture, which is the common the the composition that has the lowest melting point. <clears throat> Mixtures typically have lower melting points because they're impure, right? The the pure substance has the highest melting point, and so you use that as an um, as a test for purity in organic. Whenever you made a substance, you wanted to test, the melting point should be close to 140. You get to 135 and it starts to get wet and you're like, no, <laughs> it should have a nice sharp melting point, right? You know, at its maximum or at its melting point. And that means it's got a pure, uh, you've got a pure compound there. But if you have a mixture that increases the entropy and it melts sooner. And so that's that's what's being shown here. And so we'll, we're gonna focus on the bottom half of this liquid phase diagram. Let me ask you a yes, no question. Uh, is this substance, this mixture A and B, is it an azeotrope? So I've done the full phase diagram of this mixture from gas to liquid equilibrium, two phase partial miscibility region, and then the melting points down below. And I just need to ask you, is it an azeotrope or not? Does this mixture form an azeotrope? Someone flip a coin. <laughs> what would it look like if it's an azeotrope? That was the last lecture we talked about separating azeotropes. And we were focused in this region up here, the vapor liquid equilibrium region. So this is where you would look to see if it has a, an azeotropic behavior. And we had high boilers and they had a pinch in that liquid, that, that, that boiling point line that looked like this. It had a maximum boiling point and it had this little pinch here. So a high boiling azeotrope looks like this in the TX diagram. And a low boiler had the same kind of pinch, but it was a lower a lower boiling point. So this is not an azeotrope. You see, it, it doesn't have a pinch in the, the YA XA line. The azeotropes defined is when YA and XA touch in the middle at some mixture. So that means the liquid and the vapor phase composition are the same at the boiling point. So you can't separate them because again, the fractional distillation is based upon those lines being far apart and you get recondensation with something of a different composition. If YA has the same composition as XA, then the boiling, it doesn't separate upon boiling. Okay, and you can go back to the last lecture to, to verify that. So here, Let's go now and look at some other interesting phase diagrams. Let's look at this middle region here where we have upper and lower consulate temperatures. We did that partial miscibility last time with the lever rule, and then we'll get into freezing. So here's a, and, and also think about solutions. This, this is, I've got solutions in my pocket. There's a whole ring full of solutions. This is a solution. What is a solution? Freshman definition of a solution. Homogeneous mixture. Yeah, it doesn't mean that it's a liquid. It just means it's a homogeneous mixture. So this is a solution of, uh, what is brass? Zinc and copper? Yeah, zinc and copper. So that's a homogeneous solution of zinc and copper. And up here we have a, a solution of hydrogen in palladium metal. So if you have, I mean, almost all metals, hydrogen is so small that if you have hydrogen in a metal container, a hydrogen will dissolve into the metal. <laughs> like the little atoms will go into the metal and start to form a metal hydrogen solution. This can be really dangerous. In fact, below 300 in palladium, you get this solid solution and you get phase separation. So you have a hydride phase and you have uh, like a more um, like a metal with just a little bit of hydrogen in it. And then you have this highly hydrided metal. 
So it doesn't take much hydrogen to start forming this hydride phase. And that hydride phase can be brittle. So if you have a metal pipe that's got a, um, something with a lot of hydrogen in it, that hydrogen can cause the metal pipe to become brittle, which means it's not going to hold the pressure that you expect it to hold. So this is yet another reason why going to a hydrogen economy could be problematic because we start pumping hydrogen around in, in metal pipes, the hydridization, no, hydrides are, can form and it's dangerous. Here's an example of a steel pipe embrittled with hydrogen. So there was a highly embrittled steel pipe and it was fracturing in a tenth of an hour. <laughs> between a hundredth and a tenth of an hour. And so this is just showing how they treat it by baking the hydrogen out. So they baked it for a half hour, they baked it for three hours, and now it's almost lasting an hour. They baked it for seven hours, not much change. 12 hours, they're getting closer to 10, 10 hours of uh, protection, 18 hours. Uh, here, we, they baked it for 24 hours and they're getting above 10 hours of fracture time. So it's just to show the dramatic change in the and the tensile strength that you have when you start putting hydrogen in the into steel and other metals. So, and it's a solution thing. And there's a critical, um, you know, this phase separation is 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 what's going on. Also, if you have if you have grains of metal, the hydrogen will find its way into the grains, and so the little hydrogen atoms will get in here and collect in those grains, grain boundaries. And so then the metal just breaks along those grain boundaries. I think they're folding the carbon in. So they're making carbon steel. So they're getting from the from coal or whatever, like in the old days that we get the steel and the coal and they would get that carbon mixed into the steel and flatten it out and then they would fold it over. And and they also are, are modifying the grain structure too. Yeah. So let's look what did they know that's what they were doing? Were I don't think so. Doing? No, they just discovered it that way. Okay. Yeah, so they had all of this carbon in the steel, and they were making a really strong steel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and then they were they were quenching it too, and that that would lock in the phase of the steel in a really hard phase. Okay. So they had some pretty gruesome ways of quenching their steel too. They would stick it in some people. Oh, yeah. I thought we were like running some cold water. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that they realized. Oh, well, all you have to do is cool it down, and they don't have to actually stab a person from this tribe or whatever. <laughs> you know. Oh, I mean. Yeah. 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 So this is a really weird one. So here's two. Here's two partially miscible liquids. This is water and, and, and ethylamine. And, and you have two, fa two phases here, but then this is weird. When you cool it down, it becomes miscible. Yeah, yeah. drop water in there, it pops, because what's going on that's flashing to, water. yeah. <laughs> What'd you do, what'd you do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Especially those those substances that are, you know, they 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 they're super hot like oil and then they splash on you, they they really stick to your skin. They don't they don't roll don't roll off very well. Yeah. Um so yeah, this this is a look at this weird behavior. So we have a TX phase diagram and we have these these two phase lines. So if you were to mix this, I don't know what temperature this is, but let's just say this is room temperature and you mix these solutions together um, and you have a pretty strong phase separation. So this ethylamine is, is, is fairly pure. I mean, that's like 90% 90, 90 ethylamine in the top phase. Um, and then looks like, you know, 5% eth uh, ethylamine or 95% or water on the other phase, but you cool it down and all of a sudden it becomes miscible. That's really strange. So molecularly, how can you how can you how can you understand this? Like, what's going on with this molecule? How is it soluble in water at low temperatures and insoluble in water at high temperatures? Can we hydrogen bond with this molecule? 
Let's draw the lone pairs on here. So you might get a, a water molecule here that's going to hydrogen bond to the top of that ammonia, <clears throat> that nitrogen. <clears throat> but it's this steric hindrance from these three arms. If you raise the temperature, those things really start going, especially the dihedral angles. And so they prevent the hydrogen bonding. And all of a sudden, the one thing that was drawing this molecule into water is no longer there. And the water excludes it. So remember we were talking about uh, the active vibrations in the heat capacity? Right, we were saying none of these vibrations are active at room temperature, but the bigger the vib the mass being moved, this lower frequency the vibration. And this dihedral of these arms is pretty low frequency. So you get it up to where that dihedral starts to become activated, and now it interferes with the hydrogen bonding and excludes the water, and then you just have phase separation. Here's nicotine. <clears throat> it's got a weird one. It's got an upper consulate temperature and a lower consulate temperature. So it's miscible up here and miscible down below. And in the middle, you have to use that lever rule. So if we had like a 50-50 mixture, here's our lever, our fulcrum, and it's about equal. The two layers are about equal if it's a 50-50 mixture. But you get above 210, it's miscible. You get below 61, it's miscible. Notice I'm not showing the boiling points. Those will be up higher. And I'm not showing the melting points. Those, those would be lower. If I cool it down, eventually it would, it would freeze. It would freeze out. And then we would have the, the phase diagram of the solid liquid uh, region. So cold temperatures, weak hydrogen bonding to nicotine through these, through these lone pairs allows it to go into solution. But it's pretty weak hydrogen bonding. You raise it up above 61. Now the nicotine excludes the water, and so they separate. And then you get it up high enough at 210. What, why does it come back together? So when we get to really hot temperatures, like above 210, now the hydrogen bonding of water is less important. And so we're breaking all the hydrogen bonds of water and we just have entropy driving them together. So remember the thing that keeps things from mixing is delta H. And so we have a delta H that it's a negative delta H with water hydrogen bonding with itself to pull that apart is a positive delta H. And so we've got to put heat into the system to overcome that delta H and the temperature is driving the entropy term. So above 210, the entropy term is uh, greater than the delta H of the hydrogen bonding in the water. So, yeah. So now let's get into distillation of partially miscible liquids. So this is kind of an interesting scenario. We start here at like 95% B and we boil it. And this is, let, let me make sure that you guys understand this, this, this one step distillation, that's called simple distillation. So one step equals simple So that's, I think I, I'm, I'm going to emphasize that because that's the way I answer one of the questions on the exam. I say, if you start at A1 and do a sim, single step or simple distillation, what do you have in the collection flask? So let's do that. We, we warm A up. It boils. It produces a vapor that has this composition. And then we cool that down and condense it. See how that's just a single step. It's not the fractional distillation where we go zigzagging down to the minimum. We just do one evaporation, one condensation. So then it comes down here and, and it hits this point and we have two layers. We have layer, you know, the, I don't know, what do we want to call these layers? We'll say L1 and L2. So we had a homogeneous solution in the pot. We did a simple distillation and now we've got two layers. <laughs> Now, one of the layers is pretty thin. Which layer is the thinnest layer? Like if we were to look in a, pour it in a grad cylinder and try to measure the, the volume of these layers, one of those layers is really thin and one of those layers is the majority. 
So L1 and L2, those are your two choices. So which layer, L1 or L2, is the really thin layer? Why did you say so fast? That was good. Because of this, right? This is the fulcrum of the seesaw. Is that what you're using? Yeah. And you've got, you've got a big layer here. I'm just going to draw it as a big person. Okay. And you got a little munchkin down here. There you go. Right? So the thing closest to the, to the fulcrum, that's the big amount of moles. The one farthest from the fulcrum is a tiny little amount of moles. And so moles and volume being proportional, that would be a small volume. <clears throat> Sometimes these intersect. So look here, we have this nice region where it's miscible. So the one on the left, we would call it partially miscible. There's a region where it's miscible and a region where it's two layer. But this one over here would be completely immiscible. So using the negation here, immiscible, it's not miscible. Because we don't have any region where it's, it's a single phase uh, at all concentrations. So these come together. Uh, this is the boiling point right here. So this, this is the boiling point here for this combination. And then it cuts straight across here so there's a large range of mixtures that have the same boiling point and then this this boiling point of the the nearly pure a stuff or b this is b mole fraction of b i wish the book would like pick one and stick with it <laughs> okay so we're looking at xb across the the bottom and so really you know pure b is up here so that's the boiling point of pure b this is dirty b this is a two layer fluid that happens to boil you know at this temperature and then over here we have dirty a and then pure a up here at the top so those are your boiling points all the way around and this is the y so this is the the x a curve and this is the y a curve so that's the composition of the vapor phase and because we don't have this miscible region, this is really more like a eutectic mixture. That's why it's labeled E. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Props. Okay, thank you. XB. I need to just get in Excel and reproduce all of these phase diagrams so that they're mine <laughs> and I can do them the way I want them. But I'm, you know, I'm using the things from Atkins. So Atkins is inconsistent, I guess. Uh, this is a kind of a, a confusing use of eutectic because a lot of times people will just use eutectic for solids and it'll be the minimal melting point. But this happens to be a, a eutectic low boiler. Okay. And it's going to be hard, like in this case, it's going to be hard to, to um, distill this. You're going to get, you know, again, we take A through a, a distillation and we end up with, with uh, this, this B here and we get two layers in our, in our collection flask. And so distillation of partially miscible or completely immiscible solutions is a real pain. Um, so this whole region contains two phases. Everybody see that? And so I was, it's always fun in this time of year, I get to this plot. And so I look at that and I say, well, it kind of looks interesting to me. If you were to take this middle part and erase it, you know, y'all watching, okay. Put a couple of pink dots and some ears. It looks like a rabbit. <laughs> so it's always corresponds to, you know, the Easter season. So there you're, that's your Easter um, rabbit phase diagram. <laughs> Easter bunny. So anyway, I just wanted to emphasize what I, what I did earlier. This is that single distillation step. You take a homogeneous solution, you run it through 
a distillation and sometimes you end up with two layers and you've discovered that now you have a partially miscible situation. Let's get into, um, into the solid phase diagrams. This is my favorite. So we're going to start up there at A and we're going to start cooling it down. So, you know, we were way at the top with the vapor pressure lines and then we did the partially miscible things where you had two layers of the liquids. And now we're back to uh, a miscible liquid. We don't see any two phases here. So this is miscible up in this region. So we have a homogeneous solution of, of mostly B and a little bit of A. So it's what, 85% B, maybe 80%. So here's A, so we start cooling it down. This, uh, or, yeah, this is pure A on the left, pure B on the right. And so I've got it color coded. So look here, A is yellow, B is blue, and it's mostly blue. So it's kind of a greenish blue. And then when we hit to A2, see right here at, at A2, what happens? We've hit this line and and you you connect, you've used a horizontal line to connect to the the, the the very closest vertical line or other curved line. So you see at A2 we see the very first grain of solid B form. So that little grain starts to form. Just like if we were cooling something down and it started to condense, you'd have a droplet somewhere in the in the flask. Here, we've got a liquid in our container. We start to cool it down, and all of a sudden, a little crystal or a little solid starts to form someplace. We keep cooling it down, and what happens? Well, if I remove B from the solution, it gets more enriched in A. Does that make sense to you? I'm removing B because pure B is... is precipitating out and the, so this the liquid becomes more enriched in a look it's getting a little greener because i'm losing some blue and it's getting i've worked a lot hard on this uh, the colors and so this is it's a little greener and the beautiful pure blue is precipitating out so here we are at a3 see that then we get to a4 we've got more grains of b look they've grown so this got bigger. These little new little grains started getting bigger. Uh, this A liquid and B liquid is pointing to the green area. So all of the blue grains are pure solid B. And then we get to A4 and we sit there and that we're at that melting point uh, until all of the liquid is gone. So we keep precipitating out the B so the B grains grow and we're, the liquid's getting more and more concentrated in A. And then we hit this and it's called, when we're cooling it down, we hit a eutectic pause. So we're st stuck at that temperature until everything is solid. Because notice the liquid line ends there. So we have to sit there until all the liquid is gone. Well, what's going to happen when we try to go below that liquid? We're going to not have any more green. We're going to have yellow and blue. So we go down to A5 and we have big blue solid grains because it's mostly blue and lots of little yellow solid A. Because look where A5 is. A5 is down here where it's pure solid. And so we have mostly blue and less A. And I went to look for solid grain, like this is, if you take a, your sword or whatever and you, you slice it and polish it and get it under a microscope, you'll see this kind of grain structure. And, and you can make some, you can understand the properties of the metal by looking at the grain structure. In fact, here's Inconel 718. It's a nickel super alloy. And it's, it's probably very similar to what we've shown in this phase diagram. Big, solid blue grains. And the thing that's holding the blue grains together is a little bit of A. And now that's going to have different properties than just pure B. So let's say this is iron and nickel. Okay, I'm just picking two metals. 
you know, the pure iron will have a certain strength, certain bendability, certain ductility. Ductility is drawing it into wire. Uh, malleability is flattening it into sheets. Um, uh, there's compressive strength where you press on it before it yields. And then there's pull strength or tensile strength where you, you pull on it and it has a certain springiness and then it yields. So there's a certain tensile strength. And think about the properties of this, this structure. Now we don't have just pure B, we've got some flexibility. Let's say that, that yellow is more flexible than blue. So we can flex these grains against each other before they break. And so you can really affect the properties of a solid by changing to, a, to an alloy. Instead of just a pure iron or pure aluminum or pure nickel, you can alloy these things together and you can fine tune their properties. And that's what a material scientist does. So if you like this, then that's, this is sort of the survey course that gives you a taste of all these different things. This is material science. So maybe you wanna to go to a program that has material science masters. You have your chemistry bachelors and you go into material science masters and you learn all about fine tuning the properties of alloys or whatever. So this is the, the cooling curves that we showed just on the previous slide. So at A1, we had liquid A and liquid B. Then we started to precipitate out B. So that's what's going on at A2. And we see that the cooling curve has sort of changed its slope. So B is precipitating during this region as we cool it down. And the B grains are growing here at A3. And then A4, we're at the eutec eutectic and we have this eutectic pause, pause or eutectic halt. Okay. And so we're sitting there until the B grains are growing and the A grains are starting to precipitate out and fill in the void. And then we have the eutectic composition and then we have this solid cooling. So here we're just cooling down the A solid and the B solid. So what I want you to be able to keep track of are all of these things whether you have A liquid, B liquid, B solid, see all of these different phases, and then down here, A solid and B solid. So you need to be able to understand when you have all liquids, when you have all solids, and when you have liquids and solids together, what are those species? Okay. <clears throat> so if I were to, let's not do reacting systems yet. Let's go back. So if I were to drop you right here, could you draw the picture? So if I, I put you right here, could you draw the picture? So let's draw it. I'm gonna draw a little circle right here and I'm gonna have lots of A grains. With a little bit of B around it and they're all solid. How do I know they're all solid? Because I'm below this melting point. This eutectic melting point is the lowest melting point. So everything is solid below that. How do I know how much A and B I have? You use the lever rule. So this is your fulcrum. So I've got mostly A and a little bit of B. <clears throat> if I'm right here, then I have some A solid plus A liquid, plus B liquid. Does everybody agree with that? Look at what region I'm in. I'm, I'm right in this, this region where it says liquid plus A. So we put solid right there. And liquid plus B solid. So what's, what's the composition of the liquid? Well, that's over here on this side. So you draw the horizontal lines and those are your tie lines. So I've got pure A solid over on the left and I've got liquid A and liquid B on the right. <clears throat> and it looks like I've got more moles in my liquid than I have moles of solid because I'm close to that line. <clears throat> No, the right side is the liquid. Well, like below that, you said, like, the fulcrum, you said, on the right. 
Yeah, so over here on the right, this is the B. I have a little bit of B solid, and I have a lot of A solid. So the left side is A, because we've got the mole fraction of B down here. So I've got a lot of A grains and a little bit of B solid holding them together. You see how it's just the reverse of this. Over here on this right side, I have lots of B grains and a little bit of A holding them together because I'm over on the right side of the diagram. And then if I'm up here, I've got a liquid that's both A liquid and B liquid mixed together, but I've got more A than I have B floating around. Now, when we have, let's say we, these things form a compound, then that compound has a melting point, <clears throat> right? So that's what we have in reacting systems. And so here we have pure A, pure B, and then we have a compound C. <laughs> so here we, you know, we could double this. We have A, B solid. It's right at 50-50. So the composition of C, since it's right in between A and B, then it's the compound's identity is A, B. And so let's cool it down. Up here we have A, so here we are at A1. So this these little designations match. So this is where we are at A1. And it's A liquid and B liquid. So C doesn't exist as a as a as a pure substance in the liquid state. It's it's melted and decomposed into A liquid and B liquid. But once we get to A2, then C starts to form. So here at A2. We've got some C solid forming. So the compound forms a solid. And then we have liquid A and liquid B. We get to A3, it's growing. We get to A4, we're at a eutectic pause where C is getting bigger. And then we eventually start precipitating pure B. And so below that, we have pure B solid and pure C solid. down here at A5. Does everybody see how that can be, right? Why don't we have any pure A? Because we draw the tie lines and we stop at the first vertical or curved line we hit. So if we're at A5, we have an equilibrium or a mixture of solid C and solid B. If we were over here, and we draw our tie lines, we would have a mixture of solid A and solid C. You see that? It just depends where you're dropped on this phase diagram. You draw a line straight across, that's your balance line, your seesaw. You draw it over and it, whatever line it hits, then you stop. If we're right here, we draw those horizontal lines, we stop there at A, we come over here, we stop at this curved liquid line, and so we have A solid, plus A liquid, plus B liquid. So we never have any C liquid. We just have A liquid and B liquid. But when we start freezing things out, some of these things form compounds in the solid phase. Let's look at some real world examples, okay? Here's sodium and potassium. <clears throat> so sodium and potassium are miscible. You melt them, they form a homogeneous solution. You start cooling them down and they have this complicated phase diagram behavior, okay? So if we're, we're at B, let's, let's, let's just pick one easier here. Let's, let's cool down this right here. So we're cooling this down. We get to this spot. We have some solid, solid, I will say solid, dirty potassium. It's not pure potassium. So you stop at that line. And then we come over here and we stop at this line. We have liquid sodium and liquid potassium. If we were to cool it down, we would, we would pause here. That's the eutectic pause. And then down in this region, we would have solid, dirty potassium 
So K solid plus Na2K solid. We call that NAC because it's NAK, but it's Na2K. Yeah. Okay, let's look. Um, We'll, we'll review, when we get to reviewing uh, this, I'll talk about incongruent melting, but I wanna give one more example with pure melting points. So we'll come back to this slide and the next one on Monday, but let me look at this one. So this is silicon and calcium. And I love this one because it has all kinds of combinations. So here's the melting point for pure calcium, 842. Here's the melting point for pure silicon. It looks like it's like 1400, right? <clears throat> Here's the melting point for calcium, dicalcium silicide, I guess you want to call it that. And here's the melting point for uh, calcium silicide. Notice how these have pure melting points. I can melt this substance. It goes up, 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 and it has a really sharp melting point. And it also comes apart in the liquid phase into calcium liquid and silicon liquid. This, is, this one has a strange melting behavior. Doesn't have a maximum associated with it. And neither did the Na2K. See, this one, this substance does not have a maximum when it melts. Sodium does by itself. There's the melting point of sodium. There's the melting point of potassium. But Na2K does not have a maximum point when it melts. It decomposes before it melts. And the same with this substance here. It comes up here, it decomposes just before it melts. Whereas these substances, they have a good normal melting point. See how it's a maximum? That curve is a maximum for those substances. And so you could test the purity of these substances looking at their melting point. If you think you have this substance, but it's not quite pure, then you get up here uh, and it might melt at a lower temperature. And you would say, okay, I don't have pure CA2SI. But if you have pure CA2SI, its maximum melting point would be 1314. These right here are called eutectics, and they have the lowest melting points. And you see, they can be quite effective. This is 792. And that's, that's pretty good in terms of comparing it to 842. If you wanted to have a solution of calcium and silicon that melts at a lower temperature, 5.6% silicon in calcium will lower its melting point by almost 50 degrees. Yeah. What about this one? This is dramatic. Adding 35% of calcium into silicon can drop the melting point down 400 degrees. That's amazing. And this is how we make solders. So we want to be able to make a metal-metal bond without burning the chip. 